And I'm back. All right, so we talked about uh, the way base pairs occur in uh, RNA and DNA. Again, the change here, uh, uracil instead of binding. In transcription, the RNA polymerase binds to a promoter sequence near the beginning of the gene. The polymerase then moves along the DNA, unwinds the DNA so it can read the base sequences. The RNA polymerase links RNA nucleotides in the order determined by the base sequence of the gene or the DNA. And then the new messenger RNA is a copy of the gene from which it was transcribed. And again, artist rendition. Uh, here's the RNA polymerase binding here. Uh, this is the gene region here. So you see the promoter region is a little bit in front of the gene. It allows for the process to start. Uh, all of this excess in a subsequent step uh, will be removed, leaving just the gene. Uh, again, shows at the top, you see how the DNA is unwinding and then uh, the RNA being formed. Uh, the transcription will continue on in that direction until it gets to uh, something called a stop codon. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. And then at that point, the RNA transcription ceases. The transcript will be released. It'll leave the nucleus of the cell and go to the ribosome. Uh, eukaryotic cells modify their RNA before it leaves the nucleus. Again, that's where all those little, little ends uh, will be removed, the things that aren't needed. Uh, sequences that stay in the RNA are called exons. Uh, sub sequences that are removed during RNA processing are called introns. So if it's allowed to stay, it's called an exon. If it's removed, uh, it is called an intron. Uh, exons can be spliced together in different combinations. So one gene may encode for many proteins. So basically what, it's, what, what that statement is saying, that transcription may start and produce a very, very long pre-transcript molecule. And then areas will be removed, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the introns will be removed, and then all, all those subsequent exons will be put back together. So then when RNA starts the process, uh, at the, the ribosome starts to transcribe, translate this process, it may produce several different proteins from one big, long transcript. <clears throat> After splicing, uh, a tail of between 50 to 300 adenine molecules, which is referred to as a poly-A tail, is added to the end of the new messenger RNA. Uh, that's just to ensure that a, the stop process uh, is continuous and it'll make a whole big bunch of adenines at the tail end, and then that will uh, end translation. Uh, again, here is a post-transcriptional modification of RNA. The top, you see the DNA, and the area with the brackets is going to be everything that's produced. Uh, this will be the transcript, the transcription, the transcript made from this transcription process. But this area is not needed, and this area is not needed. So those introns will be removed, and then these three exons put together in a much more tighter, compact structure. And ultimately, here's that lagging tail and the lagging tail, and there's the poly A tail that we just mentioned. Uh, the genetic code. The information in the messenger RNA consists of sets of three nucleotides, which are called codons, uh, that form words uh, spelled with bases A, C, G, and U. Uh, there are 64 possible combinations of A and C and G and U. Uh, you know, of, of three. So you've got, so you have A, 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 and then you have A, A, C, and A, A, G, and then you have A, C, A, and A, C, G, <coughs> A, A, U. Those are what I'm talking about with three letter combinations. And if you want to know how many three letter combinations you can make, how many unique three letter combinations you can use, you can make, you take this number, this is a little bit of math, but I'm not going to expect you to do it, so don't ever worry. But if you needed to know how many different, unique three-letter combinations you can produce from those four letters, what you do, or any group, what you do is you take the number of different items you have, so in this case, four, 
you're going to make three letter combinations. So you take four and raise it to the third power. So four root three. And uh, if you do that, four times four is 16. 16 times four is 64. Uh, you can do the same thing with anything. If you wanted to know how many different three letter combinations you could make out of the alphabet, uh, you would take how many letters are there in the alphabet? 26. 26 raised to the third power. I'm not going to do the calculation because I'd have to get my calculator out or my phone. Don't want to do that. If you want to do it to see how many there is, that's fine. I'm not going to ask you. Uh, but that's how you would determine that. So you would take 26 and raise it to the third power. That would tell you how many different combinations you could have. So there's 64 codons, and most of them specify for amino acids. Now, the sequence of three nucleotides in a base triplet determines which amino acid the codon specifies. So there are 64 codons, 64 different three-letter combinations, or three base combinations, and most of those three-letter combinations are going to code for a specific amino acid. The order of the codons in the messenger RNA determines the order of the amino acids in the polypeptide that will be translated from it. Well, that means, go back here, I'm going to go back farther than I intended to. This will be for one amino acid, this will be for another amino acid, and this will be for another amino acid. That's the, the, the order in which they're going to appear. Okay, uh, there are 20 amino acids that we're going to deal with. They're encoded by 64 codons in the genetic code. First thing you should immediately be asking yourself is, well, if there are only 20 amino acids and there's 64 different codons, what does that mean? Well, that means that some amino acids are specified by more than one codon. In other words, one amino acid, if you look at the uh, AAA and AAC and AAG, maybe those three codons all code for the same amino acid. Uh, there are other codons that signal the beginning and end of the protein coding sequence. So there is one codon, which is called the start codon. Uh, it also happens to be the codon for a, 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 an amino acid called methionine. But the start codon is really easy to remember. And it's actually the only one I'm going to ask you uh, to set to memory. And that is the start codon is AUG. Very easy to remember. When does the school year typically start? In August. AUG. So. Uh, most organisms use the same genetic code. Uh, again, this is where your textbook author uh, is being really careful about semantics. Uh, all life on this planet that we know of uses this same combination. Now, when we start talking about um, the, excuse me, viruses and the RNA viruses, that's where things get a little tricky, but RNA viruses and viruses are not considered living. So all life on this planet uses the same genetic code. And so here's the codon. You see AUG, which we're going to call the start codon. Codon codes for the amino acid methionine. And then you have UAC, and then UCA, et cetera, et cetera. And you see you build on the uh, growing protein using this three-letter uh, three code called codon. Here's, an, here's the chart of amino acids. Uh, it tells you here's valine, and alanine, and aspartame, and glutamine. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to remember any of these. What I do want you to pay close attention to when you're looking at this, however, is AUG is methionine. That's the start codon. The other three codons appear in the dark background are UAA, UGA, and UAG. Those are called stop codons. When the ribosome gets to there, translation ceases. That's the, that's the signal for translation to stop. So there, that's the stop codon. 
Uh, you may have uh, uh, something to do later on in the semester, maybe in some of your homework, maybe it might be an extra credit I give you at some point, where I will give you a long strand of basis. Uh, I will sit there and go, you know, A, A, C, C, U, G, A, C, U, G, C, C, blah, 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 blah. And then you'll take this chart, you'll divide the transcript I've given you into codons, and then you will translate those codons into their proper amino acids. <clears throat> translation. Uh, translation is three, again, there's three types of RNA uh, that is involved in translation. There's messenger RNA. That's the one that carries the information. That's the one that's made in the cell or in the nucleus of the cell and exits making the transcript. Uh, the ribosomal RNA joins with some other proteins to form an intact ribosome, and we'll see a nice little drawing of this in just a moment. And then transfer RNA delivers the amino acids to the ribosome during the translation process. So you have messenger RNA, that's the pattern. You have ribosomal RNA, that's what reads it. And then you have transfer RNA, that's what brings the amino acids to the growing chain. Uh, ribosome structure. When we talked about ribosomes in the earlier cell chapter, we just talked about the fact that it was a, one of the organelles found within the cell. And I hope at that time I made a statement about uh, they're not really true organelles because uh, ribosomes appear in uh, prokaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells do not have membrane bound organelles. Uh, ribosomes are actually just really, really big proteins. And uh, we, we put them with the or organelles discussion because there's really no other place to talk about them. But they do serve a function. Uh, ribosomes in eukaryotic cells have a large subunit uh, and just a small subunit. And basically, you know, in, uh, in sort of a very, very simplistic way to talk about this, the transcript is a long strip. The small subunit is on one side of it, the large subunit hooks on the other side with the transcript in the middle, and then the ribosome works its way down that strip, reading the information and translating it into the new protein. Uh, and again, here is uh, the ribosome, the, the transfer RNA for tryptophan. Don't know why they chose tryptophan, but you can see here is the DNA. It's uncoiling. We're making our RNA. Uh, we've got a transcript on one side, and here is this new tryptophan that's coming in. <clears throat> and what you can see is that while the codon is the three letter combination that's on the transcript, the three letter combination that's on the uh, amino acid is referred to as the anti codon. So you have the codon on the transcript the anticodon on the amino acid. And those codons and anticodons, again, they are uh, complementary pairs. You got A on one side, you got U on the other side. If you got U on one side, you got A on the other side. If you got C and it's G, if you got G, it's, it's C. It's the, all, it's the alternate form or the complementary base. Translation is the second part of protein synthesis. Uh, again, messenger RNA gets transcribed in the nucleus. Uh, it leaves the nucleus and goes out into the cytoplasm. Uh, the small subunit binds uh, to the messenger RNA. Uh, the initiator trans uh, RNA or transfer RNA base pairs with the first messenger RNA codon. Then the large ribosomal subunit joins the small. The ribosome assembles the polypeptide chain, and translation ends when the ribosome encounters one of those so-called stop codons. So again, the small ribosomal subunit attaches first and starts the process. Uh, then the large subunit comes in, attaches to the small, and at that point, protein production begins in earnest. And there's again an artist's rendering of, <clears throat> here's the DNA, the blue. It opens, producing this messenger RNA transcript. There's the small subunit, there's the large subunit, there's the transfer RNA. You see the small and the large attached. If you look very closely, you see the transfer RNA there, binding there. <clears throat> Other transfer RNAs here, 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 carrying different amino acids, 
fine. And you see the little green beads screen. That's the protein being made. And you see as the ribosome moves up, more and more gets added. Uh, and another common misconception is that this happens once. No, no, this happens hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Uh, as soon as this one moves down just a little bit, this subunit here will attack. And as soon as that gets out of the way, another one will come in. So when you see these proteins being produced, all along the length of this transcript, you, this transcript, you'll see ribosomes with those growing amino acid chains coming from them. Uh, again, this is just a more detailed view of what happens. You see the first, if you'll notice on the AUG, that's the start codon, we get the thymine. Then the next three letter group, you got GUG. Uh, the complement of that is CAC, which happens to be for valine. You see the valine coming in. When those two become in close enough proximity, a peptide bond will form here. When the peptide bond forms here, this will break. That transfer RNA will leave. This one, the second one, will stay momentarily until the next transfer RNA brings in its uh, <clears throat> excuse me, amino acid, which in this case is leucine. Leucine will form the peptide bond, and at that time, when, once this peptide bond forms, this bond here will break, allowing that transfer RNA to go and pick up another uh, amino acid. And there you see it moving away and glycine coming in and attaching. And that will just continue on and on as this bond forms, this bond breaks, and that transfer RNA will go out and find another leucine molecule. Mutations. Uh, we mentioned mutations in an earlier chapter that it was a permanent change in the DNA. Uh, this may alter a gene product. Uh, in theory, Originally, however far back you want to say human beings go, uh, all human beings had brown eyes. And then something occurred that some human beings started to, that some human beings were born with blue eyes. Well, that thing that happened was a mutation. The gene for producing eye color, and technically it's genes for producing eye color, changed uh, for some reason, and people were started, humans started being born with blue eyes. And all human beings originally had black, it, again, theory, in, had black, curly, very tightly curly hair. Uh, and as mutations occurred, the color changed and the texture and uh, waviness of the hair changed. Um, a mutation that changes the gene's product may be harmful. Mutations that affect the proteins in hemoglobin reduce the oxygen's ability to carry, or excuse me, the blood's ability to carry oxygen. One of these mutations is called, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I just went blank on uh, the disease, and I'll think of it in a minute and blurt it out. Uh, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, it's not going to come to me, so. Uh, but it, does, it, is an, it, is a, um, it is a mutation that affects the, ox, the blood, excuse me, blood's ability to carry oxygen. Sickle cell anemia, that's it. I told you I would come up with it in just a moment. So sickle cell is a result of a mutated gene responsible for making red blood cells. The red blood cells aren't made properly, and their ability to carry oxygen is greatly affected. Oh, if I'd gone one more slide, it would have told me. Base pair substitution is a type of mutation in which a single base pair changes. That is called sickle cell anemia. Uh, that is... Uh, the result of um, a single base change. Now, most of the time, a single base change may not, or many times, a single base change may not affect the problem. Because again, we've got these multiple codons. So you, if UAA and UAC is code for the same protein, and a particular transcript is supposed to be UAA, but instead it makes UAC, that's not going to change anything. You know, they're, they're still going to produce the same amino acid and the same protein. But if they change, then it can cause something like sickle cell. Uh, mutations that shift the reading frame of the messenger RNA. All right, in a base pair substitution, everything's still the same length. It's just one of the groupings has changed. That's a base pair substitution. In a frame shift, what happens is things have either been added or deleted. 
So if things have been added, that makes one side longer or makes the whole DNA strand longer than it should be. If something has been deleted, then it makes it shorter than it should be. And if you add things or subtract things, then those three pair combinations are going to be different from the point of the mistake all the way to the end of the gene, everything's going to be different. And that is called a <clears throat> frame, uh, frame shift the mutation. Uh, and then certain, either by deletion or insertion, an example of beta thalassemia. Uh, and thalassemia, again, it's a blood condition, uh, has to do with blood perfusion through the body's uh, system. Uh, there is a uh, mutated uh, example of a mutation in the hemoglobin gene. Uh, again, the red stuff here, the background there and there, the red stuff's not supposed to be there. That is the result of the mutated gene. Everything should look like either the blue coils or the green coils. These red coils are the mutation, uh, and this could be a possible cause of type 1 diabetes. Uh, this patient, a person is not making a proper insulin molecule. Again, mutations in hemoglobin show that you have the change here uh, at this point right here. So if the, the strand should be th this one, this one. So you got uh, proline, glu uh, glucine, glucine, lysine, serenine. But now you've got this valine thrown in there. And it's an improper base pair. It's an improper substitution. Uh, so we have to uh, assume that this that this insulin is not going to function properly and not going to function like that insulin would. Um, again, mutations in hemoglobin. Uh, again, once you see that frame shift, you're eventually going to start seeing, you know, this is what it, this is what it should look like, but because of the frame shift, this is what we get at the bottom. So we start out with only one base pair substitution. Now we see the frame shift. Should look like this, but it looks like this. Uh, all of your cells in your body carry the same DNA. Uh, some genes are transcribed by all cells, but a typical cell in your body uses only about 10% of its genes. Every cell in your body, like we talked about with cloning last time, every cell in your body has the potential to make a whole nother copy of you. But when your skin cells reproduce to make more skin cells, they only use a very small portion. Uh, the process by which cells become specialized is called differentiation. At the very beginning of human development, when the egg gets fertilized and the egg starts to separate, everything is the same. You're basically, the cell starts making clones of itself. So from one cell to two, from two to four, from four to eight, from eight to 16, 16 to 32, 32 to 64, 64 to 128, 128 to 256, 256 to 512. Now, all of those, the cells are making exact copies of themselves. At some point, we don't worry about it. What point in this class? You take A and P, for instance. Uh, when you get to the end of the chapter, with end of the semester, uh, and end of A and P two of talking about uh, human gestation and development, you talk about where differentiation occurs. Where do those cells that are ultimately going to be muscle start to only produce muscle cells and the ones that are going to be bone start to make bone? That's differentiation. And the proteins that influence uh, transcription by binding to DNA are called transcription factors. Uh, these are the things, these are proteins that attach the way or, or influence the way transcription occurs. Uh, a master gene. Uh, is a gene that encodes a product that affects the expression of many other genes, uh, controls an intricate task such as eye formation. There are multiple, and I've got some pictures here in just a minute, there are multiple different uh, genes that control eye formation. Uh, some of them form the shape of the eye, some of them form the fluids that are in the eye, some of them form the colors of the eye, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there is a master gene that controls the production of all of those other genes. Uh, a homeotic gene is a type of master gene that controls formation of specific body parts during development. Homeotic genes are genes that occur at specific times. Uh, for instance, during development, uh, 
the formation of fingers starts at a particular time. It is under the process of a homeotic gene. And that homeotic gene must be active during a certain point in gestation. If that gene for some reason does not become active at the right time, the baby will continue to develop, but fingers will never form. Uh, likewise, there are things that control the production of limbs. You know, we've all seen uh, on the internet thing, babies born without hands, babies born without legs, babies born without arms. That's what happens when your homeotic genes aren't functioning properly. Researchers study the function of homeotic genes by altering its expression. It's called gene knockout. They introduce them. They either introduce uh, a mutation or delete a gene entirely. Uh, there are some examples. I'm not going to go into any of those. Just understand that the way we research and we study these genes is in test and, and again, we're using test subjects like uh, insects and rats and mice and other things like that. Uh, many homeotic genes are interchangeable among species. Uh, the iris gene in flies and the PAC6 gene in human beings. Uh, we're going to talk a little more about the PAC6 gene in just a second. Uh, again, when I took genetics uh, in college and when we were in genetics lab, one of the things we did was manipulate fruit flies and try to make them grow or try to raise them with different types of eyes. There's a fruit fly that has a red eye, there's a fruit fly that has a white eye, there's actually a fruit fly that doesn't have an eye at all. Uh, and oh, there's, there are the fruit flies. Uh, you see you have the eyed fruit fly and the eyeless fruit fly. You see how the fruit fly eye right here is really red. Uh, there is also uh, a form of the fruit fly that, that has a white eye, as I recall from my uh, genetics lab, that white eye is called a bar, B-A-R-R-I. It's named after a person. Uh, here we see the bottom pictures are uh, the human eye and the PAX6 gene. PAX6 gene. Uh, it's found in humans, it's found in mice, it's found in squid and other animals. Uh, uh, so, uh, but we see the development here. A properly functioning PAX6 gene, PAX6 gene produce a normal human eye. Uh, the, the mutated gene uh, causes this uh, to develop without an iris, a condition called aniridia. Again, never ask you to spell that, uh, but that it, again is a condition, and I think you can know, uh, no iris forms, no light can get to the retina, these people are going to be blind. Again, human and any other animals, the PAX6 gene affects eye formation again the affected eye on the left, the normal eye on the right. In mammals, males have only one chromosome, uh, one X chromosome, females have two, uh, but one is tightly condensed into what is called a bar body and not expressed, that's in females. So uh, all of the females' sex characteristics uh, are controlled by one X chromosome. According to theory of dosage compensation, X chromosome inactivation equalizes expression of X chromosomes between the sexes. Basically what that means is uh, the chromosomes, uh, the X chromosomes of males and females are producing the same product. Uh, and again, uh, X chromosome inactivation, you see where uh, the red is showing it's active, then over here it is inactive. The human X chromosome carries 1,805 genes. Uh, the human Y chromosome carries only 458 genes. Uh, the master gene for male sex determination is carried by the air. Uh, this is the gene that triggers formation of testes. Uh, it produces testosterone, controls the formation of secondary male characteristics, uh, things like a beard, uh, axillary hair, uh, the production of even more testosterone. Uh, we males produce more, have more muscle mass as a result of testosterone. Uh, the absence of the SRY gene in females triggers the developments of ovaries and females and uh, our ovaries and female characteristics. Uh, again, so the SRY, the gene that makes men men, uh, biologically. Again, in today's world, we have to emphasize biologically that makes a male a male. Uh, is that, but if you'll notice, the X chromosome carries about four times the information as 
the uh, <clears throat> excuse me uh, Y chromosome. So the Y chromosome is a very small relative chromosome, uh, and I've told students in the past that small little piece of genetic junk is what makes a man. Most species lose the ability to break down lactose. Lactose tolerance. This is another example of uh, a uh, a mutation. Uh, Lactose, a carbohydrate found in milk. Uh, most species of mammals lose the ability to break that down. Uh, in humans, it usually occurs around age five. Uh, the lactase gene is no longer transcribed. We no longer make lactase. Ergo, we become lactose intolerant. Once lactose production slows down, lactose passes undigested through the small intestine, ends up in the large intestine where it breaks down produces excess gaseous products, including CO2, which causes bloating and pain. If you know anybody who is lactose intolerant and they go around and drink a milkshake, then that's why they get the belly ache and the tummy ache and the tightness and the bloating and the excess gas. Um, when I was a young child in uh, growing up in South Arkansas, uh, the great thing about growing up in small town South Arkansas in the early 19, in the late 60s and early 70s and going to school was that any time there was anything that sounded like a holiday or anybody in your class had a birthday, somebody's mom was going to bring cupcakes and punch and ice cream and uh, Kool-Aid and all kinds of stuff. There was going to be a party at school, especially when you were in the first, second, third grade, kindergarten, first, second, third grade. We didn't go a month without a party. Never did we go, there was always either a holiday or somebody had a birthday, some months we had two parties. First day of the third grade, I remember this, I'll remember this to the day I die, unless I get really bad Alzheimer's or something. We go to school and uh, at the end of the first day, our teacher, Mrs. Cahey, hands everybody a note. And, you know, everybody, you know, everybody's elementary school remembers getting the notes that you had to take home to your mom. And the thing was, that my mother and Mrs. Cahey had gone to high school together. They'd known each other for their whole lives. And so I knew there was no way I was going to get out of it. So as Mrs. Cahey's handed me this note, I'm going, first day and I'm already in trouble. Oh my God. So I get home from school and I hand this note to uh, my mother and I'm just sitting there waiting for my punishment because I don't know what I've done. And mother goes, oh, well, y'all won't be able to have, uh, cake and ice cream parties this year. And I said, what? what, what, what do you mean? And she said, well, you have a classmate who has uh, a medical condition that won't allow them to consume uh, dairy products. So no cake, no, you know, ice cream, because this is way before you could get ice cream. that didn't have milk in it. Everything was made out of milk. And uh, I was like, well, why do we have to be punished because some guy, well, we had a new kid in school. First day of school, Miss Kay, he had introduced him. Said, everybody say hi to Chris. And everybody said, hi, Chris. Hey. Well, so we're all sitting at home now going, now oh, this Chris is clearly a freak. We've gone to school with everybody else. So it's got to be Chris. So we go back to school the next day, and Chris is a pariah. We treated that kid horribly because he was costing us our cake and ice cream and uh, whatever. Well, we called him a freak. Ultimately, Chris was not the freak. Chris was normal. At about five years of age, Chris's body had stopped producing lactase. Therefore, he could not produce the product for gene production, for lactase. He could not produce it. But since everybody else in the room could, we considered him the freak. Well, we were all actually the freaks. We were the result of a mutation. He had the normal gene. Uh, transcription can also be affected by chromosome structure, uh, modifications that suppress gene expression. Uh, if during structure construction, uh, a, methylate, a methyl group has added, then that can adversely affect the product being made. And once a particular nucleotide has become methylated, it usually stays methylated in all the cell's descendants. So once that cell produces another cell, produces another cell, every cell has the mutation. And there, the CH3 in red is the attached methyl groups. Uh, epigenetics, 
is uh, a way of controlling the production, methylation of parental chromosomes is normally reset in the first cell of a new individual. A new individual. Uh, all parental methyl groups are not removed. Some of them, however, will be methylated and passed on to future offspring. Again, mom and dad build up these methylations in their lifetime. Uh, when those in, that information gets passed on to their offspring, most of those methyl groups will be corrected. Uh, boys are affected by lifestyle of individuals in their father's line, girls by individuals in their mother's line. Uh, the heritable changes in gene expression that are not due to changes in underlying DNA sequences are epigenetic. So heritable changes not affected by normal DNA are called epigenetic. And ultimately, why is it advantageous for the genetic code to be redundant? Prevents uh, mistakes. You've got a lot of redundancy, so mistakes can be fixed. And does ricin impact transmission or translation, and how does it work? Ricin impacts translation. It prevents the gene from being made. How does it work? The toxins bind up the small subunit of the ribosome in the cell. The small subunit can attach to the transcript. Therefore, we don't get any translation. As always, if you have questions, email me, trussell at uaptc.edu. If you have, if that doesn't work for you, give uh, uh, the contact link, course messenger tab, and send me a message there. See you next time.